Now, Melchizedek was both a king and a priest. He served as the great type portraying a priesthood and kingship over and above that of the Levitical system. Now, Levi was, as it were, still in the loins of Abraham when Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. And the Bible says that the lesser pays tithes to the greater. So the scriptures do not reveal who Melchizedek was, and there are many speculations. And some believe that it was Christ himself. Some say it was the embodiment of the Holy Spirit. And some believe that it was Shem. And there are many other fanciful opinions as to who Melchizedek was. So some of these ideas are fanciful and some speculative, but the fact that the identity is not revealed means that the purpose of the narrative is to be sought elsewhere and not in speculation. So the Bible often tells us not to go beyond what is written. The purpose of the book of Hebrews is to contrast substance and shadow. And only here can the reason for the inclusion be sought. So that which is not revealed, according to the scriptures, is what God deems unnecessary for us to have superb or complete knowledge on. So we are not told who it is. I think we can rule out that it was Jesus because Christ was prophesied as to when he was to come, how he should come, where he should come, when he should come. So this doesn't make much sense at all. The embodiment of the Holy Spirit, the same argument can be applied there. Whether it was possibly Shem, that is a possibility. And one could speculate and run with it if one wanted to, because Shem was still alive in the time of Abraham. In fact, he was still alive in the time of Isaac and Jacob. So it is possible, but the scriptures do not say. And so to speculate is exactly that, just a speculation. So in the history of Israel, priestly power and kingly power were always kept separate, to the point that if the boundary was crossed by presumption, the result was leprosy. But in this archetype, we find them combined, because Melchizedek was both king and priest. And that makes him the perfect type for the king of glory, who was also the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The cross was the stepping stone to the throne. We have to ask ourselves, the book of Hebrews, is it about Melchizedek or is it about Jesus Christ? And the answer is, it's about Jesus Christ. He's the substance of the shadows. Not Melchizedek. But Melchizedek is a type, a very, very important type, because he was both king and he was priest. And he was a king of righteousness. And all of these labels that are attached to him make him a perfect type for the even more perfect antitype, who is Jesus Christ. So before Abraham was, I am. Before Melchizedek was, the I am also superseded him. So the issue is, why is he included in the Bible? Because the Bible requires a specific reason why Christ himself could become the high priest. And this is the burden of what Paul is trying to explain. So in the past, these offices of priest and king were separated. And sometimes some of the kings thought that they could fuse them. So one of the stories in the Bible is about King Uzziah and his pride and his punishment. We read about it in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 16. But when he was strong, this is now King Uzziah, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. 
For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And this was strictly forbidden because only the high priest was allowed to burn incense on the altar. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men, and they withstood Josiah the king, and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Josiah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense, go out of the sanctuary. For thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Then Josiah was wroth, and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord, from beside the incense altar. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out, because the Lord had smitten him. So the priestly office and the kingly office were strictly separate, except in the case of Melchizedek. And of course, that served as the type for Jesus, who also was king and priest. So before Jesus stepped into the role of sacrificial lamb and priest, he first had to be recognized as king as well. Zechariah 9 verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. He has a tremendous prophecy. And uh, I did a series on the book of Zechariah, and it is also available on YouTube. So here is this prophecy that the Messiah would be a kingly Messiah. John chapter 12, verse 13, read, They took branches of palm trees, this is now during the triumphant entry, and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Matthew 21, verse 15 says, And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. So he was from this kingly line. And as such in the past, that was separated from the priesthood. And they said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise? And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. So he was acknowledged as king by the populace, by the common people, not by the scribes and the Pharisees, but nevertheless he was acknowledged. But more than that, he was coronated by the highest authority of the Jews, namely King Herod, even if the ceremony was intended to be a mock coronation. So if we go to Matthew chapter 27, verse 27, we read, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. So here's the military might. They stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. So they put a kingly robe upon him. But they first stripped him. That's very interesting. They stripped him of his own clothing, and they put a kingly robe on him. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his hand. So that was the mock scepter. So he was crowned a king, he had a kingly robe, he had a scepter put in his hand, and a crown put on his head. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King.
king of the Jews. So there was a coronation. It was a mock coronation, but it was a coronation by the authority and by the military. And they spit on him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. In fact, they, the, the Bible gives the idea that they continually smote him over the head, driving those thorns into his skin. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off. Now, this is very important. So he's coronated. They take off the kingly robe from him and they put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Now what was this own raiment that was placed upon him? We remember that at the cross the soldiers took his raiment off and when they came to the inner garment they did not tear it in pieces to divide the cloth, the material, because it was very precious. It was woven in one piece. There was no seam in it. In other words, it represented the robe of righteousness. Melchizedek, king of righteousness. So it was taken off. He received a coronation as king. And then the robe of righteousness was placed back upon him. And he took it to the cross.